Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Kuhn, for the introduction. Thanks you also for the invitation. It's a great honor and a, and a big pleasure for me to be here. And as Kuhn mentioned, I will be talking about sustainable um, computing. So what is sustainability, right? Um, I really like this definition, which is about 35 years old. It says, sustainable development is the development that, needs to, that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Yeah. Although the definition is pretty old, it's very powerful. And if we take a look at how we are doing as humankind on Earth, the picture is not so bright, right? So this graph is showing you the Earth overshoot day. So it's the day at which we as a community, as a humankind, have consumed all the natural resources on Earth, right? In the early 1970s, what we were consuming was pretty much in balance with what the Earth can produce, whereas today, towards the end of July, we have already consumed all the natural resources that the Earth can produce. So every year, right, every year we're consuming about 1.7 Earths um, of natural resources. And this is really the motivation uh, for this talk, right? So what is the contribution of ICT in terms of consuming Earth resources? Is it growing? And what can we do about it? And this really leads to the, the agenda of today, where I want to address a couple uh, key questions. And I've been building up this talk around three parts. So the first part will be about how to uh, figure out and do research in, 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 in uh, sustainable computing. So what are the challenges there? And how big is the problem? Secondly, I, I would like to talk about um, how the environmental impact of ICT is scaling and what the contributing factors are. And then eventually, uh, I want to reason a little bit about what we as computer architects can do to reduce the environmental impact of microprocessor chips. So let's first start with the uh, challenges in doing research in this area. So as Kun already mentioned, I, I've been looking into sustainability for about two years now. I started teaching a new course on sustainable computing at Ghent University. And this is really how everything got started uh, a couple of years ago. And I quickly figured out that doing research in this area is pretty challenging for a number of reasons. And the first reason is that sustainability is, is a multifaceted problem. Yeah. When we think about sustainability, the first thing that comes up, obviously, is that global warming, right? So GAG emissions, greenhouse gas emissions lead to global warming. Everybody um, agrees on this, and this leads to all sorts of uh, disasters from bushfire to hurricanes to droughts to flooding and so forth. And ICT is, is not a negligible part of this, right? According to this recent study by Freidach and all, um, ICT is responsible for about 2 to 4% of the GAG um, emissions. You may think, well, 2 to 4%, it's pretty small. Well, it's actually on par with the aviation industry, right? So it's not really a small part, I would say. Now, sustainability is much more than just global warming. Yeah. It's also about raw material extraction. Yeah, we need a lot of materials to produce semiconductor um, devices. And just to give you a couple um, ideas, so the World Bank projects for, for us to transition from a brown um, e um, energy supplies to, to completely um, electrical storage batteries, we would need about 10 times more metals by 2050 under the two centigrade scenario. So the two centigrade scenario says that global warming should not exceed two centigrades uh, by 2050 compared to pre-industrial um, uh, state. Europe has quite similar numbers. To be climate neutral by 2050, we need um, 60 times more lithium by 2050, uh, 15 times more cobalt, and 10 times more rare earth materials um, that we need um, for the transition. Yeah. You may ask yourselves, what kind of materials do we need to build semiconductor devices? It turns out that we need pretty much all materials in Mendeleev's uh, table. Yeah? So this is a, is a picture I took from the, from the High Peak Vision. So in the 1980s, we needed about a dozen materials or so to, to fabricate semiconductor devices. In the 1990s, we needed a, a couple more. And in the early 2000s, uh, because of um, high leakage, um, a lot of innovation has been done in semiconductor manufacturing, and as a result, we, we need pretty much all elements um, in the table. Now, raw material extraction comes with a, with a number of challenges, and one of the challenges is supply chain risk. So this graph is showing you the HH index. So this metric is actually 
um, 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 a metric that quantifies to what extent a single, co a single country is supplying a particular material. And so some of the rare earth materials are really monopolized. So there's, there's only one or so countries in the world su uh, supplying rare earth materials. In this case, it's, it's, it's China, right? Um, even an index of a half for germanium, for example, there's only two countries in the world supplying um, those materials. So there's a supply chain risk. So that's the first risk with, uh, with raw material extraction. Some of the materials are rare. Um, so this graph is showing on an exponential um, curve um, the, the abundance of, of materials on Earth. Yeah. So silicon, we're lucky for us, it's pretty abundant, as you can see at the top left. Uh, but some of the materials that we absolutely need to fabricate semiconductor devices like gold and platinum and so forth, is, it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty rare. Extracting these materials is also very energy and carbon intensive. Yeah. So this graph is showing the embodied energy to extract um, a material and, and the corresponding uh, CO2 equivalents. So for example, for copper, to extract one kilogram of copper, we need about 15 megajoules of energy, and this is corresponding to about four kilograms of CO2. It's not bad, but it's not great either. Uh, but if we take a look at gold, for example, the picture is, is much worse. To extract one kilogram of gold, we are emitting about 15 tons of CO2. And so it's pretty, uh, pretty impressive. Yeah. In addition to raw material extraction, um, there's also obviously a lot of e-waste. Yeah. So, and this is a result of the, of the linear economy that we have. We buy stuff, we, we use it for a while, and then we throw it away. Yeah. Um, worldwide, we are about, we are uh, dismissing, or um, we have about eight kilograms of e-waste per person on Earth. Yeah. And this is on average across the entire world population. The Western world, the average will be much higher. And the sad thing is that only 17% of this gets recycled. Yeah. In Europe, we are doing fairly well. It's about 40% that we are recycling, but that even is not, not, a, not, a, not a nice number, I would say. Right? In addition to raw material extraction, e-waste, we also need a lot of water to manufacture semiconductor devices. And so this is a graph that I took from a very interesting study from IMEC, uh, where they try to um, quantify what is the envir environmental impact of semiconductor manufacturing. And this particular graph is showing you the amount of ultra pure water that we need to um, in liters per square centimeter of, of a chip that we are uh, fabricating for a number of different chip technology nodes from 28 nanometer on the left hand side towards three nanometer on the right hand side. So for manufacturing one square centimeter of, sim, uh, of silicon, we are, today, we need about 14 liters of um, ultra pure water. This is a bit abstract, but let's take a, a look at the total water consumption of TSMC, for example. Um, today, they are using about 100 million metric tons of water per year. Very abstract number. I did the calculation last night that co it is corresponding to about a hundred, more than a hundred actually, Olympic swimming pools per day, right? That's the amount of water that they need um, to, to, to manufacture uh, or to uh, empower their, uh, their power plants. And this is not just a resource problem, it also creates a lot of tensions in, in uh, societal tensions. For example, um, the high-tech industry uh, fighting uh, against the farmers in Taiwan uh, because of epic droughts um, over the last couple of summers. And then lastly, another a very important point, I think, is, is that we need new business models, and I, I also believe we need legislation um, to incentivize us to step away from a linear economy to a more circular economy. And um, a circular economy can help us in many ways. It can reduce the amount of e-waste. It will reduce the impact on, on climate. We will need far fewer um, resources, far fewer materials. And, and uh, we also take away some of the risk of, uh, the, of the supply chain, right? And that really requires a different mindset um, in terms of design for repairability, design for second life, and, and, mm -hmm. and so forth. Mm -hmm. So now that we have a fairly good view of, uh, of sustainability, um, the next thing is, well, um, let's get our hands dirty and let, let's do some research, right? 
the key problem here is that there is a lot of data uncertainty. Just to, to give you one particular point, so you may have heard about LCAs. These are life cycle assessments, and Apple is, doing, is, is, is reporting these LCAs for, for all the devices that they bring to the market. And this is an extraction from an iPhone 12 um, LCA, where it explicitly says that there is inherent uncertainty in modeling carbon emissions due to um, data limitations. And they have a, Apple is actually doing a fairly good job trying to figure out what is the total carbon emissions in the production process. But even there, there is quite a bit of unknowns. And in some cases, they need to rely on industry, industry averages and, and, and some assumptions. And this relates to just fabrication. When we take a look at the usage of the devices, what they do is they take like a three to four year period of the average user um, uh, using um, the devices. Yeah. So they are basically using historical data. But is historical data predictive? Well, as we know, the number of apps that we are downloading, that we are using, is, ex is, um, is, um, is increasing pretty rapidly. And as we all know, smartphones can be quite addictive. Yeah? We, at home, my wife and I, we have four teenagers in the house, so I know what I'm talking about, right? So inherent data uncertainty, <clears throat> that's the second point. And the third challenge is that we really need to take a look at the entire life cycle of a computing device. Yeah. So if you take a look at the life of a computer device, on the left-hand side, we need to extract the materials, we need to fabricate the chips, we need to assemble them, we need to um, manufacture the, the, the entire devices. Eventually, we need to assemble them, we need to transport it to the user, um, eventually, people use the device, uh, also consuming energy, obviously. And then th throughout the lifetime, maybe in these devices need to be repaired. They need to be maintained. Eventually, we throw it away. And hopefully, some recycling, some reuse happens after the first lifetime um, of a computer device. On the left-hand side, this is typically called the upstream embodied footprint. Product use is typically referred to as operational footprint. And then towards the end, we have the downstream um, embodied footprint. You know. So when we think about sustainability of a computing device, we really need to think about the whole life cycle from raw material extraction all the way down um, to, to recycling. And when I started thinking about this problem, and I did a Google search about in, in, in terms of courses on sustainability, most courses would just cover power and energy efficient computing. And, and a power and, and energy efficient computing completely ignores um, the embodied footprint, namely the uh, footprint because of manufacturing. Right? Now, so here's a question. Does a more energy or power efficient computing device lead to an overall reduction in carbon footprint? Well, the answer is no, not necessarily, because making an individual device more car carbon friendly um, doesn't necessarily need to an overall reduction in carbon footprint. I would say it's a necessary condition, but it's not a sufficient condition. And the fundamental reason is this rebound effect. Yeah, you may have heard about this. It's also, count, uh, also called the uh, Jevons paradox. It's actually a counterintuitive uh, finding, but if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. So if you make an individual system more energy or power efficient, it may lead to an overall increase um, in footprint. And as we make a device more efficient, then it becomes easier and cheaper to use, and that incentivizes the usage and the deployment, and as a result, we end up with a total um, increase in footprint. And so this is named after Jevons, who is an economist, um, who, who made the observation, like when James Watt came up with a more efficient steam coal um, engine, that the actual consumption of coal increased rather than, than decreased. Yeah. So this is something we, we should take into account. And that's why I'm saying like um, uh, improving the carbon efficiency of computing devices is a necessary condition, but not a sufficient condition. Yeah. And that's where business models, I think, and also legislation comes into play to force us to, to not overconsume, um, if you wish. So this concludes like the first part um, of the talk. Yeah. So let's now think about how does the global environmental footprint of computing scale and what are the computer, uh, contributing factors? So we really want to understand um, what are the different contributing factors and how can we um, actually make a difference in this space. 
So I've been um, looking at the Kaya identity. So the Kaya identity is an identity um, provided by, by Kaya, who is an energy economist. And this Kaya identity is actually being used by the United Nations um, IPCC reports um, to make projections about um, total carbon uh, footprint um, in the world. It's a very simple formula. Um, it, it calculates or decomposes the total CO2 emissions as a product of total population, P, then G divided by P, which is the, the amount of GDP generated uh, per person on Earth, times the energy in intensity of GDP, so the number of kilowatt hours of energy that we need to produce one unit of GDP, times the carbon intensity, the amount of CO2 equivalents that we are emitting in the atmosphere um, per kilowatt hour. So if you take a look at these different parameters in this um, equation, we, we can make the following note. Like population is growing, yeah, it's still growing um, as, as we speak. It's going to saturate around uh, 2100, uh, the year 2100, but until then, it's still uh, increasing according to the projections. GDP per capita is also increasing, which actually is a good thing, right? It means that the average welfare across the world um, is improving. You know? Then if we take a look at energy intensity, so the amount of energy that we need per unit of GDP, it's decreasing. And that's a result of our industry to be uh, more energy friendly. Right, so that's actually a good thing too. And, and most of our economy is no more service-based than really manufacturing-based. So that really contributes to a decreasing energy intensity. And carbon intensity, the amount of CO2 um, uh, emissions per unit of energy is also decreasing. So it's slowly decreasing, but it's decreasing. Yeah? We're, we're slowly shifting towards solar um, energy supplies, wind supply, um, hydroelectric uh, supply, and so forth. Now, if you, if you multiply population growth with GDP per capita growth uh, with energy intensity and carbon intensity, what we figure out is that the total CO2 emissions is actually increasing. Yeah. And this is really the basis for these um, IPCC um, reports. And a key conclusion here is despite that energy intensity and carbon in intensity is moving in the right direction, it's completely um, offset by the increase in population and the increase in GDP uh, per capita. So with this, knowing this identity, I asked myself the question, can we somehow reformulate this, identi this Kaya identity for architects to reason about um, and the, the different contributors to, um, to, uh, um, to carbon emissions due to ICT? And I've been making a distinction between the embodied emissions and the operational emissions knowing that we need to take into account the entire life cycle of a computing device. So for embodied emissions, um, the GAG protocol sets out how to make a distinction between the different contributors. And so they talk about scope one, scope two, and scope three. And so scope one is really the chemicals and the gases emitted in the process of manufacturing devices. Scope two is carbon emissions as a result of energy consumption during fabrication, and then scope three is due to the material extraction. Yeah. There's very little data about material extraction, so I'm not, I'm not including this in, in, in my analysis, uh, but it follows the other um, scopes um, to some degree. And then, of course, we also take a look at the operational emissions. And so here are the equations that I, that I came up with. Um, and so the different parameters are sort of parameters that we have control over as, um, as architects, as computer systems um, engineers. So in the embodied scope two, emissions is, is a product of the number of chips that we are producing times the number of wafers that we need to produce to, to manufacture all those chips times the energy that we need to, um, to manufacture one wafer times the carbon intensity in the manufacturing process. And so that's the first equation right here. For scope one, we have a quite similar equation. It's the number of chips times the number of wafers that we need to produce to, to produce those chips times the carbon equivalents because of the chemicals and gases, so the fluorinated gases, who are also very powerful greenhouse gases um, emitted in the process of, of manufacturing. And then for operational uh, footprint, we have the number of chips times the total energy consumed by a chip over its entire lifetime during usage times the um, uh, carbon intensity of the energy at the, at the location of the user. Yeah. 
So let's take a look at the different um, parameters in this equation and how they scale um, over time. So the first um, component or the first factor here is the number of chips. Yeah. So it turns out that the demand for chips is increasing. Yeah. If we take a look at historical data, the number of chips that we are producing and, and consuming is, is increasing by about 9% per year. Yeah. So that's an important uh, factor here. How many wafers do we need to manufacture to produce all these chips? Well, that seems to be sort of stagnating because die size is sort of stagnating, right? We've, we've made that observation to, uh, around the early 2000s. Um, recently, we've seen a, a continued growth in, in, in die size, but now this is also stagnating as we are reaching the reticle limit, yeah, as you can see uh, in this little picture here of Lisa Su um, from AMD. So in, in my equations, I've been assuming that the, that the, con, um, that the C, CAGR, so CAGR stands for um, compound annual growth rate. Um, so the percentual increase per year, um, I'm, I've been assuming that this is uh, relatively constant. Now, the amount of energy that is needed to produce one wafer is rapidly increasing as we go through new chip nodes. So this is data again from this um, IMAX study um, showing the amount of energy needed to produce a wafer for 28 nanometer um, tech node at the bottom all the way up to a three nanometer um, chip technology. And so new tech nodes have become so complex and we need probably a, a couple thousand processing steps um, to manufacture um, an, an, an entire wafer. And looking over um, a larger time scale, we can see that the total energy needed to produce one wafer is increasing by about 12% per year. Yeah. And a recent study from, from Greenpeace um, um, points out that the semiconductor in industry will consume twice as much um, energy um, as of today by 2030. Yeah. So these numbers um, don't fall out of uh, thin air. If you take a look at the chemicals and gases, so these are the fluorinated gases that I talked about before. Very powerful greenhouse gases. Some of these fluorinated gases are, have a warming potential that is probably 20,000 times more powerful than, than CO2. Also, these chemicals and gases um, to produce one wafer is increasing by about 9% uh, per year. Carbon intensity is, is decreasing. Um, which is a good thing, right? So we're trans transitioning to green energy sources. Um, this is good. Uh, about, uh, in Europe at least, about 2.5% uh, per year. It's, it's not bad, but it's not great either, I would say, right? Um, and, and people may argue like, okay, in data centers, they are increasingly using green energy sources, which is true. Um, but I think we, we need to make a critical note here. Um, many of these green energy um, uh, sources for, the, for these data centers are obtained through green energy contracts. And to some extent, it's really a form of, of green, uh, greenwashing because the amount of green energy that is available is, is limited, right? And so if these data centers consume a lot of green energy through these green energy contracts, then that takes away the green energy that other consumers can use. Yeah. If we take a look at the total um, operational energy consumption, it's actually decreasing. And so this is data um, shown here for different um, iPhones from a very interesting study from Udit Gupta and from Harvard in collaboration with Meta, um, showing the um, carbon footprint of, of a number of um, iPhones and the operational use is, is decreasing over time, right? So um, we've been optimizing our devices for lower power consumption, lower energy consumption. And this is because of us, because of our community, right? We've been uh, making the hardware more energy efficient. We've been making software more energy efficient. Um, and so that really leads to a decrease in, uh, in total energy consumed uh, by these devices. So if you take a look at the entire picture, well, there's a couple key takeaways, right? So the demand of chips is increasing. And it's probably a result of Jeffen's paradox. Yeah, uh, it's really becoming a commodity product, right? The amount of energy needed to, to produce a wafer, the amount of chemicals that we emit in the process is really increasing you know, with every generation. The transition to green energy sources is not moving fast enough. And moreover, it doesn't even affect 
scope one and scope three. Yeah, we still need a lot of, a lot of materials. We still are emitting a lot of uh, chemicals and gases, even if we are just using green energy sources for semiconductor manufacturing. Yeah. And then, okay, although we have done a, gr a good job making our devices more energy efficient, um, at the end of the day, um, it turns out that the embodied emissions um, are dominating um, or will soon dominate because of, of the trends that we are seeing, right? The number of chips is increasing by about 12% per year. The uh, carbon uh, footprint per wafer, the chemicals and gases per wafer is increasing by about 10% per year. And this is really outpacing um, the reduction in, in carbon intensity, right? And, and so the embodied emissions are really um, increasing, the operational emissions are sort of decreasing uh, and definitely in relative terms. Yeah? So at the end of the day, the embodied emissions are going to dominate um, pretty soon if they don't already do so. Yeah. So what can we as computer architects do to reduce the environmental footprint? And how do we reason about um, sustainable uh, computer system design in light of this inherent data um, uncertainty. And my approach has been to really embrace the inherent data uncertainty. Uh, I have a background in modeling, as Queen was already mentioning, and so my initial reaction was like, oh, well, let me build a, a very simple first order model that is deliberately simple and really build on first principles to provide um, a lot of insight. And the key idea was, was the following. So we were, um, I, I've been using proxies for the embodied and the operational footprint where, that we have control over as computer architects. Yeah. And then the things that we are not so sure about, that, we, that there's lots of uncertainty about, we are going to parameterize um, that ratio, for example, between embodied versus um, the operational footprint. So let me walk you through the proxies that I came up with, and then we will go into a couple of case studies to illustrate what we can learn from this uh, very simple uh, model. So the embodied footprint, so the unit of fabrication is semiconductor fab is a wafer, as I told you before. And so the environmental impact of producing a wafer comes from the energy consumption uh, for manufacturing, the chemicals and gases that we are emitting, the amount of water that we need, and the materials that we are using. Yeah. So the bigger the chip, the higher the embodied footprint is going to be uh, per chip, right? As we all know, a wafer is, a, is, a, is like a pizza uh, form, right? So the larger the dies, the more area we are wasting on the edges um, of the wafer. Uh, but still, if you do the calculation, it turns out that the embodied footprint per chip is actually relatively linear, is, is quite linearly proportional um, to die size. So a very simple proxy that we can use is chip area. So um, chip area is really the proxy um, for the embodied um, footprint. When we think about operational footprint, um, I've been making a distinction between two different scenarios. The first scenario is a fixed work scenario where we assume that the amount of work that the device is doing during its lifetime is fixed. Yeah. In that case, the total amount of energy that the device is consuming is proportional to the operational footprint. Yeah. As you can see in the little um, schematic over there, I'm showing power consumption as a function of time. It's really the area of this box that is proportional to the operational uh, footprint. So the proxy here is just energy consumption. Yeah. Now in practice, because of Jevons' paradox, probably, yeah, as the device becomes more efficient, uh, we tend to use it and, and, uh, at least as much as before, and we tend to do more work with our devices. Yeah? So that's why I came up with this other scenario where uh, I'm assuming a fixed time scenario. So the amount of time that we're using the device is the same, right? So effectively, we're doing more work. Um, at that point, as you can see in the little um, uh, diagram over there, then total energy consumption, total operational footprint is no longer proportional um, to uh, energy consumption, but it becomes proportional to power consumption. Yeah. So in that case, the proxy for operational footprint really is uh, power consumption. Yeah. Okay. So now we have a proxy for embodied footprint, which is, which is chip area. We have a proxy for operational footprint, which is energy or power consumption, depending on the scenario 
that we're assuming. The question now is how do we weigh the embodied footprint versus the operational footprint? Yeah. And the ratio of embodied versus operational footprint really depends on a number of factors. And the first factor is device type. Yeah. So this is a graph taken from this um, Gupta paper from HPCA 2021, a very interesting paper you should all read. Um, and it's quantifying the embodied footprint versus the operational footprint uh, for different types of devices. So on the left-hand side, you can see a number of battery-operated devices. So these are tablets, smartphones, smartwatches, laptops. Yeah. And on the right-hand side, we have a number of um, always-on devices. So these are desktop computers, gaming consoles, um, and, and so forth. So what is, what is quite obvious from this graph is that the um, contribution of the embodied footprint is higher than the operational footprint for the battery-operated um, devices, whereas it's the other way around for the always-on devices. Also, lifetime has a big impact on the ratio between the embodied versus the operational footprint, right? The longer the lifetime, the longer the relative weight of the operational footprint is going to be. Or put differently, the longer we use a device, the more we will amortize the embodied footprint over the longer lifetime um, of the device. And then the energy mix that is constantly evolving, it also really depends on the location of the user of the device. Um, so that also um, has an impact on, on the relative weight of the embodied footprint versus the operational footprint. So the solution I came up with was like, oh, why don't we simply parameterize the ratio of the embodied versus the um, embodied footprint? And that's what, we, that's what I've done. So the model that I came up with is, is super simple. It, it just quantifies the normalized um, total footprint as a sum of the embodied footprint plus the operational footprint. Um, and the proxy for embodied footprint is uh, chip area. The proxy for operational footprint is energy or power, depending on the scenario that we're assuming. And then we have this alpha parameter that weights the embodied versus the operational footprint. Yeah. And obviously all these numbers um, or normalized. It's a very simple model, um, but the real power of this is that by changing the weight, for example, the alpha, if we slightly change or if we consider a range of, of alpha values and we, we reason about what the impact is on the total carbon footprint, and we are, if we are reaching the same conclusion depend, independent of the parameter that we're choosing, then we can be quite confident about our conclusion despite there's so much data uncertainty, yeah. And I will be showing a couple examples there. Um, and so in the, the, the case studies that I will show, um, I've been making um, a distinction between uh, two different uh, cases, one where the embodied emissions are dominating, which is a proxy for the uh, battery operated uh, devices, and, and then uh, another case where the operational emissions are, are dominating alpha around 20% uh, uh, for the case, um, for example, for the always um, on devices. So what insight can we gain from this very simple model? Yeah, I, I'm, I have three case studies that I will uh, walk you through. So the first one is, is a die shrink. Yeah. So very simple thing. So we have an existing microarchitecture that we want to implement in a new tech node. So what's the impact on the embodied emissions? Yeah. So ideally, um, moving from one tech node to, an, to another tech node, this leads to a reduction in chip area by about 50%. Yeah. That used to be the case. Maybe it's no longer the case today, but let's assume um, that this is the case. Yeah. So we have a reduction of chip area by 50%. Now, moving to a new tech node involves more energy consumption and more chemicals emitted in the process because we're implementing this microarchitecture in, in, in a new tech node. Yeah. Between two tech nodes, we have about a 25% increase in energy consumption, about 20% increase in chemicals and gases. So net we end up with a decrease of the embodied um, footprint. When we think about operational emissions, well, um, if we assume for a minute classical scaling, right? So power consumption reduces by a factor of two, performance improves by a factor of 1.4, so energy consume, uh, consumption also reduces by a factor of 2.8. Of course, we know we are no longer in, in classical scaling, post and art scaling, power consumption is, is, is the same, but energy would still um, reduce. So at the end, we, 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 we observe like a net reduction um, in the environmental footprint for a die shrink. Yeah? 
Now, this is not what we've seen, right? On the contrary. Uh, and this is really um, a result of, uh, of um, it, it's another example of Jevons paradox. Yeah? The, the, the cost for an individual transistor has decreased exponentially. And as a result, um, computer architects have continued to add new features to the, to the microarchitectures, making it more uh, super scalar, um, add some more sophisticated branch predictors, add more caches, add more uh, cores. And now we're, we were seeing a proliferation of accelerators. Yeah? So this is definitely not what industry um, has been doing. Yeah? But if we would have continued to do die shrinkings, then um, the environmental impact of, of um, microprocessor chips would actually have reduced over time. Um, but this is not what we've seen. So here's another case study where um, I'm, I'm comparing different microarchitectures. It's a little bit of a complicated um, slide, but let me try to explain you. So on the left-hand side, we have two curves um, showing um, the case where the embodied emissions are dominating. So alpha varies between 70 and 90%. And on the right-hand side, uh, we are assuming the that the operational emissions are dominating. And the two top graphs are assume assuming a fixed work scenario. So the proxy for the em operational emission is energy. And the bottom two graphs um, assume um, a fixed time scenario. So the proxy for operational emissions is, is power consumption. And I've been considering four microarchitectures, an in-order processor, an out-of-order processor, and then FSE, which is a forward slice score, and then um, precise run-ahead um, execution, which I will talk about in the next slide. So what I want to focus on right now is a comparison between an in-order and a forward slice um, core. Yeah. So these graphs are showing um, normalized footprint, carbon footprint on the y-axis versus normalized performance on the um, horizontal axis. Now, forward slice core is a, is a reduced complexity um, core that we designed with, that I designed with, with my students. We published this in Impact 2020. Um, at that time, we were not thinking about sustainability. We were just thinking about making uh, or coming up with a microarchitecture that is less complex and still achieves um, high performance um, compared to, uh, to an out of order core. So if you compare this FSC architecture compared to an in-order core, if under a fixed work scenario, uh, we, we see a significant boost in performance, and we also see a significant reduction in carbon footprint. And so the reduction in carbon footprint really comes from higher performance, power consumption being relatively the same for the in-order versus FSC, and as a result, energy consumption is drastically reducing. So that's where we, we get the uh, carbon footprint reduction from. In a fixed time scenario, because chip area is relatively similar and because power consumption is relatively similar, um, so it's not doing too much in terms of the carbon footprint, but we still see a significant boost in performance. And so overall, the conclusion is like, yes, FSC, it was designed as a complexity uh, effective microarchitecture. It actually leads to a more, it, it actually is a more sustainable uh, microarchitecture, um, if you want. Yeah. The picture is, 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 is a bit different if we compare a precise run-ahead um, execution compared to an out-of-order processor. So precise run-ahead execution, if you don't know uh, what it is, it's, a, it's another technique that we uh, published also in, in, in 2020 in HBCA. It's actually a very precise um, prefetching technique. So think about it as like a speculation technique. Yeah. So in the fixed work scenario, where we just use it looking at um, um, chip area and, and energy consumption, we actually see a reduction in the carbon footprint, especially when the operational um, uh, emissions are dominating, um, which is a good thing, right? So you, so you think like, okay, um, speculation um, actually uh, reduces um, the carbon footprint. But in a fixed time scenario, because um, the, this technique increases power consumption, it actually leads to an increase in, in, in carbon footprint. Yeah? So I I call this technique more like a weekly sustainable um, technique, right? Only un under specific circumstances, only in a fixed work scenario does it re reduce carbon emissions. But in a fixed time scenario where we start using the device more frequently because it's more efficient, we actually increase carbon emissions. Yeah. So it, that's a bit puzzling, right? As engineers, we continue to, to make devices more efficient and we're actually making the problem worse uh, rather than, than, than better, right? So that's something to to think about as, as computer architects. And then the last case study I would like to highlight is the accelerators. Yeah, so 
Uh, we are in the end of um, uh, the notch scaling and uh, uh, we are reaching the radical limits. The, so the only thing we can do, we have this golden era of computer architecture where, where hardware specialization is really um, the goal here, right? So I've been taking data from a paper published at ISCA 2010 from, from Stanford, where they compare an H264 um, accelerator against a general purpose CPU. Now this accelerator, it's a video decoder, achieves the same performance as the CPU, but it cons consumes 500 times less energy, and it's 15 times smaller than the CPU. Yeah. So if you take a look at what is the embodied emissions, well, of a CPU plus accelerator, right? So we have a 6.5 increase in chip area. So that's the, uh, so we have an increase in the embodied emissions, but we obviously have a reduction in operational emissions because the accelerator is much more efficient. Yeah. How much reduction we get in operational emissions is really a function of how, much, how frequently we are using the accelerator. If we're using the accelerator most of the time, then we are going to see a net uh, decrease in, in total carbon emissions. And this is exactly what this graph is showing here for two, the two scenarios, one where the embodied emissions are dominating and the second scenario where the operational emissions are dominating. Yeah. So if the operational emissions are dominating, it's a no-brainer. We should definitely go for accelerators, right? The carbon emissions is, is, is rapidly uh, decreasing the more we use the accelerator. However, and that's probably mostly the case for today's systems, especially handheld devices, when the embodied emissions are dominating, we would need to use in this particular case, this accelerator for at least 20% of the time for this to be a reduction in carbon emissions. Yeah. I don't think we're using H264 accelerator 20% of our time, right? And this is just for a single accelerator. Let's take a look at what we, do, what we have today. Today's SOCs, about two thirds of the entire chip is de devoted to accelerators. Yeah. So I've been assuming exactly the same thing as in the previous slides with one important difference. We're now assuming that accelerators are occupying like two thirds of the entire chip. Yeah. If the complete emissions are dominating, well, dark silicon, right, is really harmful, right? And if the operational emissions are dominating, uh, for this particular case, we would need to be using the accelerator for more than 50% of the time, which by definition, because of dark silicon is impossible, right? So my end conclusion here is that dark silicon is actually harmful when it comes to sustainability. You know? Now, I'm not a doom thinker. I think we, as a community, we, we should take action. And I think there's something we can do, right? Uh, think about reconfigurable accelerators that could be reused across applications, right? If we consider like a CJRA or an, or an FPGA, yes, the embodied footprint will be higher compared to an individual accelerator. But if you consider uh, an, uh, tens of accelerators versus one FPGA versus one CJRA, maybe there's something to be gained there. Yeah? And I think we as a community um, can take action there. So to wrap up, ICT's contribution to global warming is significant, 2 to 4%, and it's increasing. Um, assessing computer architecture sustainability is challenging for a number of reasons. It's a multifaceted problem. There is inherent data uncertainty, so really calls for industry to provide more, more data. And we need to take the whole life cycle into account from raw material extraction all the way down to how to deal with, uh, with e-waste. Total carbon emissions is continuing to grow um, under current scaling trends. Um, many, many different studies are reporting this and the embodied emissions will dominate if they are, if they are not already dominating um, today. And so computer architects and, and, and software um, optimizers have primarily focused on trying to reduce operational emissions. And I think what this analysis is showing that rather than, you should, we should continue to focus on reducing operational emissions, but what we should really focus on is try to reduce the embodied emissions of the devices that we are uh, fabricating. Yeah. And then this very simple first order model, I think really can give us a lot of insight and intuition, and it really provides a reason, a framework for us to reason about different trade-offs and a variety um, um, of scenarios. And so, if you're interested in, 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 in sustainability, um, either as, an, as a researcher or as a reviewer, this, you can use this model to make a quick assessment about the impact of, on the environmental um, uh, footprint of the devices or, or the, the features that you come up with. Yeah. And so 
I think this is an exciting and, 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 and there is important work ahead of us for the entire Hypeak community from um, hardware designers all the way um, to, to software developers. And so with this, um, I want to thank you for your attention. And I put a, a couple pointers out there for, for papers um, that I um, have been publishing. And there's one more paper coming up at ASPLOS uh, 24 in a, in, a, in a couple of months about this first order model and a couple of case studies illustrating what we can do uh, with this model. Thank you.